Did you know that every stoplight on the planet has a bad place? A spot that no matter how experienced of a driver you are, no matter how well engineered the intersection is, and no matter how appropriately long the yellow light timing is, if you happen to be at that spot right as the light turns yellow, you won't know if you're supposed to go or stop. This car thought it could stop, right? That's yellow light, yellow means stop. Auto safety engineers make our mistakes a little less deadly, and that's cool. But even better, freeing people from the bad place to begin with. They're stuck in this, do I gas or do I break moment? This is a safety problem. I mean, obviously we're not gonna fix the human mind, right? But we can play with the traffic signal. Could we give the controller so much information that it could spot if you're a driver in distress and throw you a lifeline, perhaps without you even knowing it? In the last video, we talked about the consequences when engineers make yellow lights a little too short. Ooh, looks like it's ticket time! And you can't go or stop. That was their fault. This time, it's our fault. When you're really close to the intersection, like this close, you know you need to- Go, go, go! That emotionally feels right. And all of us reliably go every time. And when you're back this far from the intersection, it's also really obvious what you should do. Stop. Yeah, I'm not gonna make that, I better stop. And we all stop reliably every time. It's right here somewhere in the middle that it gets awkward. Should I go or should I stop? I kind of have time for both. And that creates unpredictability, which is when crashes happen. Because we don't know what the cars around us are going to do, and we react in a different way, and everybody crashes into each other. And that can happen at an intersection, too. The bad place is where one driver may choose to stop, but the person behind them chooses to keep going. The truck said, oh no, I'm going way too fast for this. He went barreling around the car. Spencer Banta works for a company which uses radio waves. These are the 16 individual radar beams. Which can turn a traffic signal into basically a little air traffic control tower. The stopping distance for this car is different than this truck. And we're not accommodating for that, for this change in size and shape. Technology which watches our car come in for a figurative landing. But if we want to get rid of the bad place, we have to first understand why our brain creates a bad place. Now, I'm no psychologist, but have you ever heard of the uncanny valley? It's this idea that humans are really, really good at spotting other humans. So when we make a forgery on the computer, it's also really obvious to us until that forgery gets really good. We know it's fake, but a part of our brain is tricked. We freeze and don't know what to do. An indecision zone is kind of a valley like that. When the light first turns yellow, the likelihood that we're going to go or stop is reflected in an upside down bell curve. It's nearly 100% at the finish line, but drops to 50-50 the farther back we get. And the reverse is true. 100% guaranteed we will stop if we're far enough back, but our emotional probability gets muddy the closer we get. Our brain perceives it as time and not distance, so the faster a road is, the larger the bad place is. That makes it really easy to see on a high-speed road like this one. If we're closer than two seconds away from the intersection when the light turns yellow, every single one of us has the emotional instinct to keep driving. Even if you have an amazing motorcycle that could brake that fast, the car behind you can't which shows emotionally we have good instincts. And the reverse is true. We all will instinctively try to stop if we're more than five and a half seconds away, universally. Only a maniac would try to make that light from that far. So if we basically behave the same in the green and in the red, it's the yellow in the middle that we've gotta be worried about. A place where our driver behavior is no longer uniform. We need to rescue all the cars trapped in that bad, awkward place. Maybe we can trick people into showing up later. Or just move the whole valley to a time when there isn't a car there. One method is an advanced warning flasher. Something kind of like this, except the lights only start flashing when the green light is really old and stale. And lets drivers know about 500 feet early, you're not going to make it. 
you might as well start slowing down because by the time you get to the intersection, the light's going to be turning yellow and red anyway. There's no need to rush to a red light, so you start coasting off. That slows you down and it pulls you out of the indecision zone. You're definitely in the choosing to stop range. About 15 years ago, Utah put in one of its first advanced warning flashers. I just moved back from Oregon. I'd never seen one. So I was talking to my younger brother and he says, oh yeah, that thing, when it starts flashing and tells you that you need to stop, you need to stop. You're not gonna make it. I know, I've tried. You're not gonna make it. As much as I really want to get sidetracked talking about advanced warning flashers, I'm not going to do that in this video because I know a guy who's done a lot of research on this and I want to talk to him first. No, today instead we're going to talk about advanced signal detection. Instead of getting you to slow down for a red, one of the traffic light gave you a little extra green. When the signal's ready to change to yellow, we need a lifeguard who can spot somebody in the bad place and blow the whistle. Tell the traffic signal to hold on for just a second. You'll find in the dilemma zone a loop detector. It acts like a doorbell and lets the computer know somebody's in the dilemma zone and it can hold the green light a little bit longer. We can take five and a half seconds, multiply it by the speed limit, and know exactly where that sensor needs to go. Just put their loop right here at about 322 feet. And then they'll set the controller to extend for three seconds. And then every time a stoplight is running out of green and about to turn yellow, it can take a look at that loop of wire and see if a car's covering it. And if there is one, it sends a little bit of electricity to the computer. And that adds three more seconds of green time, which pushes that valley behind the car. It's basically a button that says, more. Okay, three more seconds of green light. More. Three more seconds of green light. More. And it does this until it runs out of time. More. It hits a maximum. Aw, oh, man. But it did a pretty good job of keeping a lot of vehicles out of the indecision zone. As long as you're going the speed limit and not driving a big rig truck. Either of those and it starts to get a little bit tricky. Actually, trucks makes it a little bit more complicated because typically they say for a truck, the dilemma zone is 2.5 to 7.5 seconds. And then there's people who drive faster or slower than the speed limit. That goes up and down. That can go up to 60, down to 40, down to 30, right? As that vehicle's coming down here, this is their actual dilemma zone. They're stuck in this do I gas or do I brake moment for, you know, almost a second before they even hit the loop. Loops are a really good lifeguard. We just have to be driving in the right place at the right time, and that only works if we get them placed properly. So where is the right place? It's here. But everybody speeds, so it's actually here. But if it's a truck, it needs to be back here. But that's assuming the truck's speeding. If the truck's going the speed limit, it would go here. But if it's a truck going slow, trying to find its way up a hill, it might actually be here. If they decided to just carve up the whole street, that wouldn't work either, because which loop should the computer listen to? They have to just pick one. A loop's always in the same place, so the measurement distance is always the same in that equation. And when there's only one loop per lane, there's no way to determine speed. It's just like a doorbell. I can't tell how fast the car is going by. So you have the equation, and it just keeps putting the same distance and the same speed in over and over and over. It's going to get the same value, even if it's wrong. And so it's a little bit optimistic to hope that a simple formula could take that all into account. Because trying to guess when people are going to arrive at the line isn't really algebra, it's statistics. Hey, you do all those YouTube videos. What's that? Said, you do all those YouTube videos about street planning and highway stuff. Seriously, you know, you've seen hey, them? I, I saw the Texas one where you're talking about the freeway interstates and the way they do stuff, yeah. Awesome. I was driving lights and sirens, I got T-bone here. Oh, right? dude. dude, that sucks, man. Yes. I hate this intersection. The experience of this on-the-job road fan reminds us why traffic engineering matters. You got some LAPD people on your <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't think you can top that. Engineering is not nerding over math problems. It's about keeping real people safe. 
why don't we simplify this? This is where Spencer, we're continuously tracking, gets excited to show off what radar can do. It will differentiate between a larger vehicle and a smaller vehicle, and then allow you to set two different pr parameters. And this is actually a patented protected feature. This is something that's kind of unique to Wavetronics, which is why you haven't really seen it everywhere. Well, here it is, a nondescript plastic box mounted to a metal pole. But inside is an antenna that shoots radio frequency waves 500 feet down the street. Those waves reflect off the bodies of passing cars and trucks, and those reflections come back into a receiver in that very boring looking plastic box. Loops also require a pretty significant road closure, and asphalt technicians have to go out and cut holes in the street to lay the wire in. I talk about that more in my video about cameras. Radar has the same benefit a camera has. One guy in a bucket truck can jump up there and install one of these in an hour or less. But it sounds like the magic starts once the radar dish is fired up. This thing can determine the size of a vehicle approaching. It bounces off the, this much of the vehicle, right? And then we only get this much return. It was it a lot, was it a little? And we were able to do it with enough reliability to say, well, the passenger vehicles, they just look a little bit smaller. It can determine the speed of a vehicle approaching. You're going all sorts of different speeds along here, and the radar can tell that. So we can already put in better data. And because radar looks at a range of area, it can be watching the entire indecision zone bad place at the same time. So in our software, you can go in and you can actually set it up, you know. What range do you want? He's showing how engineers can set which cars the radar should watch versus ignore. You want the detections to come in. Loops trigger for every single car that drives over them, even ones we want to ignore, like this one turning in a driveway. And so the idea with radar is that it can be cycling again and again and again. We're constantly, we're getting multiple measurements. Continuously collecting everything we want to know about the approaching cars. We're getting each vehicle's speed, uh, range, and estimated time to the stop bar. Which means fresh, constantly updating numbers to plug into our math equation. No more garbage in, garbage out. You'll see that there's a truck that approaches right here. And that truck meets a different criteria. It meets a 7.5 second criteria. It extends for that, that truck and it keeps it green for that truck all the way through. Based on that information, we can find a gap where there, there aren't gonna be any vehicles on both sides at the same time and just terminate the phase right there. Loops add three seconds to the green light, simply to be safe. We really don't know how much time the car needs, and well, three seconds sounds pretty safe, right? Well, we don't need to do three seconds anymore because we're not looking at one point. Let's just do a half second or one second extension based on demand where it is. Looking for that safe gap, we found it now, right? Looks like there's a gap here, and that's when we would terminate the phase. Around here, you notice that as soon as you're through the light, boom, it's already yellow, and it's, it's going back. This is the part of the video where I get behind the wheel and show you how an advanced detection system works. But I have a problem. I have nothing to show you because when an advanced detection system works the way it's supposed to, it just works and you don't really notice it. Wow, the light turned yellow at a comfortable place. I must just be a really good driver. I've been driving through advanced detection systems my entire life and haven't realized the thousands of times it's been looking out for me. Another cool feature, this is supposed to work in all weather. Rain, sleet, snow, fog, sand. It's not impervious, of course. Uh, no detection really is, right? Whether it's a loop on the road and the car drives in the wrong spot or it's a camera that gets a snowpack lens. Severe Utah weather begins now. Wouldn't the radar bounce off the snow? Well, it turns out, no. Radar has a longer wavelength than visible light. Where it lives is right here. That apparently lets the wave just kind of bully its way through all the elements, bounce off the car, and then come back. So apparently it works pretty well. Um, so this is, a, this is actually a look at the antenna. So you can see these are the 16 individual radar beams. Now on the back here, a little bit harder to see, but we have a digital signal processing board and that's transmitted out the, out the back. I'd wondered too, how do they get the wire from way up there all the way down here? I guess they actually drill a hole right in this pipe and then they have a little service door right here that they can unscrew and pull the wire out. From here, I don't know how they get it across the street to the box, but at least I know how they can get it down to the ground. It goes 
into this box here, and then that's how the calls will actually get there into the controller. Spencer is a good marketer, and this looks like a really good product, but I hate to give companies free commercials because they're not paying me to make these videos. So I did a little bit of homework. I reached out to somebody who wanted to stay anonymous, but is an expert in advanced signal detection. And I asked, is this Wavetronic stuff marketing hype or is it the real deal? And he took a deep breath and he said, right now nobody can touch them. It's not to say you can't do advanced warning detection a different way. He'd heard of one company that was playing with thermal sensing. And I came across another company that at one point 15 years ago was using a camera-based system, but that product got pulled from the market. Wavetronics really went out of their way to assert their patent. You see the word patent all over the Wavetronics website. Spencer used the word patented patent. protected feature. They're very proud of what they've built here. And it sounds like they have good reason to be. But that level of competition was kind of interesting to see because it's something you'd expect of Apple and Samsung, not two companies that make traffic signal hardware. But that's a good thing, right? Because if these companies are always trying to one-up each other, you and I end up with a better traffic light. What's not to love about that? When I was a kid, I thought Viewers Like You was a company that sponsored PBS. <laughs> Thank you to viewers like you who have decided to contribute on Patreon. It really does make these videos possible. Let's keep exploring transportation together.